Thanks, Dale. I would like to, you to think about this question. What was new in Stuxnet? Just think about that for a second. I'll give you a hint. It was not the zero days. We have seen zero days before. And as you will remember, the first version of Stuxnet didn't even come with one zero day. So what was it? Next thing, it was not a SCADA attack. Why is that? Because it was an attack against the physical process and against physical equipment. Now, what is the difference? I think this difference is crucial to understand from a conceptual point of view. For the SCADA hacker, the job is done when they are able to own the box. Let's just say the DCS server or the PLC or whatever. And then usually it is alleged that now they can do anything. If they would be honest, they would have to tell you, uh, well, actually, I don't have a clue what to do with that box, but it must be pretty bad. Um, so in, in uh, Stuxnet, we have seen something that's way beyond that. It's not an, an attack against SCADA or industrial control systems. It's an attack against the process. And here is a basic sketch how that worked. So uh, obviously, as everybody knows these days, the, uh, the uh, goal was to damage these centrifuges. And there were actually two ways to make that happen. Uh, by the way, that objective was, uh, came, came with uh, pretty interesting constraints, uh, such as uh, don't cause catastrophic destruction. Uh, I can only speculate why uh, this was deliber deliberately uh, chosen. And one of my speculations is, well, if you do that, if you just do that um, um, equipment degradation, uh, your international, international lawyers will have a hard time uh, telling everybody this was an act of war because an act of war implies the use of force. And this argument is very difficult to make in respect to Stuxnet. It would have been much easier if there was catastrophic destruction, which the uh, attackers could have achieved. That's absolutely clear. They could have blown up the joint, but they chose not to. Uh, so what, how did they make that happen, uh, the, that centrifuge damage? Basically by using two different vectors. One is the overpressure attack vector. So I'm, I'm completely on the physical process side here, OK? Um, where they uh, try to overpressure the uh, centrifuges. And uh, I think uh, at this time, everybody knows why that is a problem. It's, uh, it's also briefly explained in To Kill a Centrifuge that you can download from the internet, from our website. Uh, how did they achieve that? They had to uh, manipulate the isolation and overpressure valves. And in order to do that, uh, they had to compromise the controllers, in this case, the Siemens S7417. And then they used the second attack vector. Again, we start with the physical side of things, the rotor speed. And this is the, the attack that everybody really knows quite well these days, even though many people think that was also the attack where um, the, um, the, uh, where the uh, recording and playback of the central values uh, was used. That's not the case. We only have that in, on, on the left side. Uh, so I don't need to go to the drives manipulation, etc. So the one thing I would want to point out is that the uh, compromise of industrial control systems is really only the start. Uh, and this leads us to, to the lessons learned. What you can see in, in that whole campaign and, and how the attack executes is um, an engineering methodology, uh, which I call cyber-physical attack engineering. And my definition for this, for this is the application of technical analysis and experiments to identify and implement digital alterations of cyber systems that cause direct harmful physical effects. Now, as a matter of fact, if you think about it for, for a second, certainly this is something that's subject to engineering methodology. It's kind of an abuse case of an existing plant. Uh, depending on, on which side of the fence you are, you could say, well, that's, that's good that hackers 
just, it's just beyond their, um, their horizon. Or you could say, well, as a hacker, oh, that's bad. I, I really have to, uh, to step up my game here if I want to make, uh, make it credible that I would be able to do significant damage to uh, existing installations. Um, what you need to do in order to make that, oh, let me, let me, uh, let me um, get back in. I think I, I want to add one, one interesting thing here. Um, this aspect or the, this whole area of, of the cyber physical attack, so the, the engineering of the attack is actually a little bit easier than you might think because there are, let's just say, a thousand ways uh, to sneak into complex IT or ICS products, buffer overflows, all the stuff you know. However, there are usually only very limited ways to cause physical trouble. Uh, let me give you an example. If you are operating a large data center, again, there are probably more than a thousand ways how you would want to, to do an IT attack. However, there are basically only two ways for a cyber physical attack. When you think about the building control systems, there are ba basically two things you could do. You could try to overheat all those boxes by messing with the HVAC, or uh, you could simply cut their power because uh, all the, uh, the electricity is, uh, is automated. So the, the, the electricity distribution within the data center. So that's not thousand, it boils down to two cyber-physical attack vectors, and this is why I'm saying, well, this is doable. We, we can analyze this. Uh, as an attacker, we could engineer an attack for that, and certainly what interests me most is, as a defender, I can simply block that attack path once that I have identified that. Um, this whole concept of um, cyber-physical engineering is based on an understanding of malicious control. Uh, so you really, want to, to achieve deterministic effect, specific deterministic effect. And if you want to do that, this implies that you are able to take over control from the legitimate um, systems or people. Uh, by the way, control cannot be shared. There can only be one control instance, okay? So uh, you, you have to make that happen. Um, when uh, you achieve that, the actuators, which is the important part of, of the whole scenario, uh, the actuators are controlled by the attacker's code or data. It's all about the actu actuators at the end of the day. And the victim may or may not recognize loss of control. Um, I believe that the, uh, the idea of disguise, of fooling the operators, is a little bit overstretched because some of the attack scenarios that I uh, find more interesting uh, would imply that, uh, well, let, let the operators just see what's going on. They can't do anything anyway. They can just uh, follow the disaster unfolding. And as you, depending on, on how deep you are in the, in the matters, uh, you will know that um, there are some scenarios where it basically doesn't matter if the operators notice what go, what's going on, they can't do anything. Uh, just uh, think about the Fukushima nuclear disaster, for example, the nuclear safety systems were, were running, so they were operational, um, but that didn't help much. So, um, let me try to explain where, uh, where you can start this methodology. Uh, if, uh, so, so we start on, on the cyber side and, and later on I'll talk about the physical side of, of several categories of physical effects. Um, certainly the first thing that you would have in mind when, um, when you think about cyber-physical attacks is you just mess with the uh, SCADA systems or ICS components. So basically a simple IT style attack. Uh, and as, as you would think after my introduction, that really doesn't give you very much. Um, you could exfiltrate information. Uh, however, the, the more interesting information in, in these facilities usually is not stored on ICS, it's somewhere in, in on lab systems, for example. Uh, or you could, if, if you wanna uh, 
simply disrupt systems. Certainly, as everybody knows in this room, this is quite easy. However, you don't achieve a deterministic effect and the, the um, size of your effect basically correlates with scale of how many systems you are able to infect. If you do a Boreas attack only on one controller in a facility that's, uh, um, that's driven by, let's just say, 500, um, you, you won't achieve much. Uh, the, the next step would be uh, that an attacker tries to abuse your ICS environment at the application layer, uh, which means uh, another <coughs> popular scenario, I take over the HMI screen, either uh, by VNC, RDP, or whatever, or I, I discovered that uh, screen uh, via Shodan, for example. Now, um, as, as we know, for media people and for the general public, this is one of the horror scenarios. Uh, for us, it should not be because uh, if you do a little bit of analysis, you will often find that uh, there is a limited risk of disaster if you simply mess with, with all the set points, etc., because most process engineers are not idiots. So even if an operator tries to, uh, to exceed certain thresholds uh, by either uh, by intent or uh, just out of stupidity, uh, there is still some control and protection lo logic that simply prevents something bad from happening. Um, so again, that doesn't give you much. The, the next vector is a little bit more interesting, uh, in my opinion, uh, quite uh, underestimated in this area. Um, for most um, contemporary SCADA and DCS applications, you will find uh, an open uh, software interface for, uh, for third-party applications, an API. This may be OPC, uh, however, um, I found it more interesting uh, uh, what, what you can do with proprietary software interfaces. Just for example, you see the uh, the acronym ODK um, that stands for Open Development Kit. That's a proprietary software interface for the uh, Siemens PCS7 and WinCC systems. And uh, funny thing is, as in, in many of these cases, there is no authentication required. So once that you um, um, open that interface, you can basically uh, overwrite all the process values. Um, it just uh, as a hint to, to you defenders, now the offenders, please don't listen to this. Uh, everywhere when a vendor um, advertises something that's open, like open development kit, well, that's a good, uh, a good hint that, um, uh, that you would have to, uh, to close that uh, so, so that there is a um, security issue involved. And uh, last vector on this slide, everybody knows that, certainly once that you have Modbus, you could try to send uh, malicious Modbus commands or even malformed Modbus commands. But again, uh, my point is that uh, the, the risk that something extremely bad is going to happen is actually quite low because uh, you still um, should consider that the control protection or safety logic does not allow um, any uh, harmful commands to be executed. Which brings us to the next <coughs> level, uh, which is much more interesting. So if you um, are really going for malicious control at the end of the day, what you need to do is you need to be able to manipulate the control logic, protection logic, or, sa or um, safety logic. And uh, as everybody knows, this is what we have seen in Stuxnet. Um, there is one last uh, vector that uh, is quite interesting. When, when you, so when you think beyond the controllers, um, what you, the, your, your um, let's just say the, the, the very last point in the process where you uh, can aim at, um, that's the sensors, the input signals. 
Uh, why is that interesting in respect to malicious control? Again, do, uh, do not just think about these guys fooling the operators. Just uh, think about ways to manipulate the process. Now, here's the thing. Um, certainly, the control logic um, behaves depending on sensor signals. So, if you are able to manipulate the sensor signals, this actually gives you an angle uh, towards the control logic and to the behavior of the actuators. And I'm, uh, at, at this point, I'm really uh, thinking more about closed loop uh, connections rather than passing this information to the operator um, and uh, make him uh, uh, do some uh, stupid or, or inappropriate actions, etc. So how would you do that? Um, uh, certainly one thing you could do is you could plant rogue inline hardware if you have the physical access. And uh, Jason was kind enough last year to to uh, come out and tell us he wants to live on a, on a Bluetooth chip and, and uh, actually demonstrated how that could be implemented and what the effects could be. Uh, the, the second vector would be um, certainly you can also uh, change the uh, or fake uh, the input signals at the controller level, which we have seen in Stuxnet in the 417 attack code. Everybody will remember that, so the recording and replay. Uh, if you do that, uh, that's, I think it's very interesting. The, um, the legitimate control logic that was still executing on the controller during the attack, the, uh, that legitimate logic would simply uh, arrive at inappropriate uh, signals to the actuators. Uh, another thing that I would like to stress one more time, uh, if you want to do that um, on such a controller, you do not hack, you use legitimate commands. So overriding or faking the input signals can be done using legitimate commands for these products in question. Well, uh, I don't know about you, but if you ask me, if I have this opportunity, uh, I, I must be a damn fool if I try to hack anything or try to find a buffer overflow or whatever. Uh, that, that would be pretty silly. Why not use the open front door than trying to break into a window on the back side that might be recognized by the, uh, by the victim and uh, th that, that window might be repaired because I'm, before I'm actually ready. Um, so that's a, a, a quite good um, angle that I could use. And the, the last vector mentioned on this slide is sensor decalibration. Uh, most sensors uh, have to be calibrated. Uh, there is a legitimate uh, interface to do that. And uh, if I use that interface, I can decalibrate the sensor. What does that mean? Um, uh, wrong signals, wrong input signals. That doesn't uh, really reflect the, uh, the, the real state of the, pro of the process. Uh, one example for this, let's just assume you wanted to mess with some valves. Um, and these valves are controlled in a closed loop by, um, uh, by field controllers. And, um, they are, and, and those field controllers are attached to pressure sensors. Okay? Now, since this is a closed loop architecture, if I decalibrate the sensors to always signal uh, pressure values within the thresholds, the overpressure valves will never open. Um, the added benefit in this scenario is, as you can see, some of these uh, field level controllers are installed, as the name implies, in the field. And so operator, or excuse me, maintenance personnel goes by every now and then, and they have the chance to check the readouts. 
So this comes with a display, this little thingy. And uh, if I would only try to, um, to manipulate the valves remotely, uh, then still the, um, the maintenance personnel would be able to detect the compromise because the, uh, the, um, the readout would show um, the, um, um, the real value. So that's quite a, quite a smart um, attack vector. And uh, on the left side, you see the um, technical product menu, a uh, manual of that, that product of that controller. And it gives you a very easy description on, on how to actually calibrate any single sensor using a legitimate command. And uh, for those uh, who have been there 2012 when I did my Stuxnet deep dive, you may remember uh, I was uh, talking about, briefly talking about a data structure or, or a loop with, with 11 steps. Uh, that almost drove me crazy because I couldn't figure out what those 11 steps would be. Now, uh, um, after I was able to identify that uh, uh, pressure controller, it became pretty clear because you need, uh, uh, you have the, the 11 uh, steps in the, uh, in the calibration command. Um, uh, if, if you want to check that, it's roughly about a minute 40 in that um, Stuxnet deep dive that's still uh, accessible via the Digital Bond website. So now let's talk about physical effects and tactics. Um, I believe it's quite important to, to realize that um, it's not just about destroying uh, actuators like pumps or whatever. Um, the, uh, the important question mm, is uh, not just what can I do to the actuators, but also what can I do with the actuators. Uh, so, for example, kill people. I am not necessarily interested in killing the actuator. I might be more interested in killing people. So I'll talk you through a, a couple of, of categories, physical uh, uh, categories, what, what you could potentially try to, uh, try to achieve with a cyber physical attack. Uh, first, the, the big thing that everybody um, fantasizes about and the catastrophic destruction. Well, that's basically, if, if you want to do that, you, you have to identify uh, targets where, um, where, a high, uh, where high energy is, is present. So, uh, so you just look, you, you identify the components where the energy is. And that may be electrical energy that that may be other forms of energy. So I'll just give you a brief uh, rundown here of, of, the major, um, of the major angles that you would be interested in. Um, the next category that I think is uh, very much underrepresented in our discussions that we have with the media, et cetera, uh, would be um, somebody wants to achieve mass casualties. If I want to do that, I don't need to blow up a turbine, for example. Um, if you are interested in producing something that would qualify as a cyber 9-11, to quote uh, former Defense Secretary Panetta, uh, I think the only way to actually make that happen is the release of hazardous material. I don't see any other way so far. Um, and uh, the interesting conceptual point here is uh, this is, a, is an attack category that doesn't have anything to do with destruction. I'm not interested in uh, destroying equipment or in destroying that plant. My, my major interest is in releasing, for example, poisonous gas. And after the attack, um, the chemical plant is still intact. Okay, um, next category, of <coughs> equipment degradation. This is what we have seen in the case of Stuxnet. And it boils always down to um, uh, the application of me uh, mechanical or thermal stress, which at some point in time uh, will damage the 
equipment. And uh, that's, um, that might be done via uh, vibration or by friction or by overheating, anyhow, as, as any, uh, 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 anybody with, with a background in material science will be able to tell you or even will be able to calculate. Uh, so the effects are deterministic. And uh, my last category is uh, compromising products. This is another example that I believe is underrepresented in uh, the discussions that we have. Again, it has nothing to do with destroying uh, equipment in the, um, in the target. It has to do with manipulating products, like ma manipulating recipes. Um, and uh, as you can guess, um, this can have dramatic effects if you think about industries like pharmaceuticals or food and beverage. By the way, I, uh, we have seen that already in food and beverage. I think I mentioned that uh, a couple of years ago in, in 2008, there, there was a, such an attack in Germany against uh, a dairy farm. And no, not a farm, but a dairy processing uh, facility. So they try to uh, uh, compromise the, the, the pasteurization process for the milk. And uh, certainly this also extends to safety relevant parts, think of auto brakes, etc. cetera. Um, so this is another category where that does not involve destruction of equipment. Um, then the, uh, the last thing that I suggest to look at when doing this type of analysis, um, there are uh, several processes um, that are at, at certain times much easier to attack than at other times. So for just uh, for example, if you think about a steady process, a stable and steady process, uh, that might be a little bit difficult, but if you look at the transient, so for example, starting the process or shutting down the process, and most process engineers will be able to tell you right away, yeah, yeah, this is where we always need to watch the, thing closely because um, it can, uh, uh, it can um, result in problems. And certainly as your um, capable attacker, uh, you would, uh, as a capable attacker, you would try to take advantage of that. So that might be uh, process transients, it might be supply or demand bottlenecks, or even specific ambient conditions like weather conditions. Um, here is how I see, to wrap that up, I see the, uh, the problem of, of cyber physical <coughs> attack engineering like kind of a maze where at the top we have cyber entries and at the bottom we have physical exits. Now again, just remember in process control in, in factory automation, we are talking about determinism. So at the end of the day, the question for me is, is there any combination of bits and bytes that if I throw that at this plant will result in harmful physical effects? Now this is a question that can be answered with engineering methodology. Uh, what I try to do here with the two different colors is to uh, identify, so the, the upper part is in, in magenta, that's just digital. And then at, at some level there is a cyber physical boundary. We are very only talking about um, analog and physical. So again, uh, if, if there is an attack or, or a path in that maze to one of the exits where it just goes boom, uh, then I know that I have a problem. And, uh, and, and what we try to do is we, to we try to identify these potential paths. And if they exist, uh, certainly we try to cut them. And one way that uh, how we do that is um, by using heuristics, we try to identify waypoints. So just, uh, you know, like a gas station on, on, on the road uh, uh, where uh, we know this is worth looking at. Um, and these waypoints um, help us to, uh, to arrive analytic results within a reasonable amount of, of time. Um, let me give you a couple of examples how we do that. 
um, as I said earlier, if you are worrying about, or if you have, have to worry about um, catastrophic damage, you have to look um, at, the, um, um, at the places in, in the uh, target where there is a presence of high energy. Uh, if you are considering um, potential mass casualties, you have to identify where is the has hazardous material stored or processed. Um, now, you don't have to start from scratch because uh, for the more interesting targets, um, your safety engineers already uh, took care of a couple of things. Um, and uh, in, in many cases, these safety analysis are actually uh, published. And uh, Brian Singer referred to that um, in, um, in, in, in his talk, um, that this is a good starting point. You just have to, um, to take into account that the safety analysis is just, again, just a starting point because the safety engineers do not um, consider and elaborate on uh, malicious, um, malicious targeted manipulations. They only consider random failure. And uh, this is a little bit sad, but anyhow, we can add that. The, the major idea is if, if you uh, are dealing with a safety critical facility, the, the major question is, what is about compromise? I'm not interested in failing a safety system because I know this is fail safe. So I, I won't get anything other than, a, um, than a, um, a shutdown of the plant in a safe manner. But what about compromise? And uh, this is something that, that safety people uh, do not consider because it's just out of their scope. And what we have to do is we have to bring it into scope. Um, then you can, uh, you can look at um, expensive hard to replace equipment, presence of protection and safety system, um, uh, uh, contamination sensitive products, etc. cetera. Um, last thing, um, the... Um, what, what we are very much looking at is uh, the potential of effect propagation, uh, which means, for example, in the physical space, in, in that green space at the bottom in the maze, uh, where are the, uh, the support systems? Very, uh, simply, very simple to answer usually, and uh, it's always, I mean, it's, it's quite easy to understand. If you, uh, just for example, uh, want to mess with, uh, with rotating equipment, uh, try to identify where is the lubrication system. Okay, because if you cut the lubrication, then uh, your uh, rotating equipment will sooner or later run into trouble. And uh, you can do the same thing for the cyber part. Uh, for example, easy, easy waypoint to identify where are the engineering systems. Uh, I think we pay way too little attention to the engineering systems. I'm uh, actually much more interested in uh, portable engineering systems, you know, the laptops that, ev uh, that all the contractors carry in and out, rather than in the big DCS servers. Okay, that concludes my talk. Any question? Okay, so let's, um, I'll get a mic, Liz, you can run around. Anyone have any questions for Ralph? Start over here. I'll kick us off. Tim Yardley, University of Illinois. So, Ralph, I've always enjoyed uh, your work and your perspective. Um, so I'll, I'll toss one out there that, uh, that is based on motivation. Um, so what you do as an attacker on, on the system is dependent on your motivation, right? So um, what's the low-hanging fruit for them if their motivation is to take the system off? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of different things that they could attack. You could yeah. use physical, you could use yeah. cyber, but, you know, what's the low-hanging fruit for them? Uh, I don't know, and actually, I'm not that much interested in that. So, uh, it's, it's, I, I like the question because it, it helps me to make a point. Um, I spend very little time speculating on the motivation of potential attackers. What concerns me most is the existing uh, characteristics of a given target. And usually in, in my line of work these days, these are high value targets. 
So I'm just interested in the question for such a high value target, be that a nuclear power plant or the data center, as I mentioned earlier, is there any of these direct paths to disaster? And the direct path of disaster, you could also uh, translate that with critical risk or critical consequence. So this is what, what drives our analysis. Um, you know, the, the one problem that, that I have with um, fantasizing about threats and attacker motivations, uh, they can change overnight. And, uh, and, and let me add one thing, as some of you know, I'm a psycholo psychologist by education, and uh, not even psychologists are able to predict human behavior. Just you know, think about your wife or whatever. It's, you, you're always going to run into surprises. Uh, and I would consider that uh, the same thing might happen to our threat environment. So I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm not really that much, in much interested in the, uh, the attacker motivation. Certainly I am interested in the question of cost of the attack. Okay, so uh, this could relate to your low-hanging fruit. So what would be the, the easiest way uh, uh, to cause damage? Certainly we look at that. And that uh, usually is um, uh, depending on the target where they, uh, as you may know, or, or as, as many of you know, um, most asset owners have their, when they uh, approach cybersecurity and especially ICS security, they have their, uh, there are problems that they are simply have fallen in love with. That may be network security, that may be uh, trying to apply every security patch that they can get a hold of. Uh, however, at the same time, certainly, they uh, have some, some blind spots. And these blind spots, like uh, completely ignoring uh, the physical uh, attack vector with all those contractors going in and out, that could be, for example, the low-hanging fruit. If, if you have a question, you can either raise your hand or send it to S4 question at digitalbond.com. Over there. So cyber, uh, cyber physical systems have become a focal point for U.S. government funded research. Uh, is that true? I didn't know. <laughs> for offense, but <laughs> for defense also? <laughs> um, so you know, people, so in, in the classification that includes drones, includes cars, right? Anything, the definition is there must be a sensing component and there must be an actuator or moving component. Now, when cyber physical system grows and you touch the, in that direction, do you see that the damage can be more immediate instead of it could last for months or years because if someone hack a car or hack a drone and that can cause damage or injury immediately, right? what, what do you think? Uh, I'm not sure if I really understood your question. Uh, so basically the, um, the question if, if you can or want to cause immediate effect, um, that can be answered um, Technically, it depends on the target. Is that possible or not? It, you, you have to analyze the specific target that you have in mind. Or uh, maybe I just didn't get the question. Well, it, we, you know, we had drone in the party, right? So uh, yeah. you know, people, when a drone become more popular, yeah. then people can hack a drone, they can uh, cause damage or injury to the general public. So that might bring the awareness is closer to home? Uh, I don't know. Actually, I, I, I really don't bother that much with the so-called Internet of Things, so all the consumer products that uh, you will be able to hack into very soon uh, because the damage is quite limited. So what, what concerns us are the, um, the high-value targets, such as nuclear power plants. Um, so let me give you another example, home automation. If you think connecting your fridge to the internet is a good idea, that, I mean, that, then that's your problem if that stupid fridge gets hacked and your, your food uh, simply goes to waste. Uh, but that's not something I believe we, we should really focus our discussion on. 
I really suggest that we, um, that we focus on, on the major uh, potential impacts that are related to um, critical infrastructure. Ralph, uh, one of the things that is always asked by people maybe more outside the industry, but I think inside the industry as well, is how hard it is to do these attacks. And as you said in your talk, most of the focus has been on the ICS yeah. attacks, yeah. attacking the, the system the as system opposed to the system rather than process. the process. Yes, the, that's right. So, but, but the question is, yeah. how hard or easy, and this is a very broad question, I know, but how hard or easy is it to put together a team to figure out how to attack the process? Well, I think the, the first uh, thing to understand is uh, you need somebody else than hackers. So you need process engineers, for example. You might need metallurgists, just depending on your uh, target that you have to protect. Or you, you might need power engineers, like uh, uh, as, as we have heard in one of the talks at S4. Uh, and that's certainly, uh, luckily, that's something that's out of scope for the usual suspects in the hacker community. However, uh, and, and this relates to the answer of, of the preceding question that I gave. Uh, now, when we think about critical infrastructure and we think about high value targets, well, I mean, give me a break. If I really want to, uh, to try to blow up your nuclear power plant, um, that's worth something for me as an attacker. Uh, so I probably am willing and able to afford uh, a nuclear engineer um, an, an operator of a nuclear power plant and uh, just go through that process. So I think that's quite important. And, and I told you earlier that I'm not that much, much interested in the threat. However, um, it, when it comes to high value targets, I mean, just no longer talk about hackers. Um, try to understand or try to identify once that, but, but when you're thinking about nation states or state sponsored organizations, we were talking about a whole new level of capabilities. And the, the, the second thing I believe is, is very important in respect to the question, Dale. Um, at the end of the day, this is technical analysis and engineering, which means there is a methodology behind that. And at, at some point in time, I will be able to automate parts of this methodology. And then we are going to have a real problem. Because then when, when the, the major uh, parts of the attack are packaged in a software tool, uh, then you no longer need that competent team that, that might include three uh, power, uh, power engineers. You no longer need that because it's prepackaged. Um, so, since you brought up uh, Tim Yardley, University of Illinois again, since you brought up the nuclear industry, um, uh, I'll, I'll toss another one out there to think about. Um, nuclear has predominantly been an analog world. Um, within the past, you know, X number of years, digital controllers like the Triconics platform, for instance, has um, have been uh, approved. Um, when you start looking at process and you start looking at assumptions that have been made in how they protect the systems, they, when they assume things from an analog world, that changes very much when you start moving to a digital world. How does that affect things um, uh, in terms of, of risk management, risk assessment? Do you have to go back to ground zero or is there some middle ground where you can start it? Well, certainly there is something that, uh, where you can start um, because the uh, the, the safety analysis for, for nuclear power plants is at, as, at a very high level. Uh, so you don't, you, you don't have to start from scratch. I, I believe the, uh, the more difficult part is, as I mentioned earlier, to understand that safety uh, does not include malicious attacks, so ma malicious compromise. Uh, not trying to fail your um, safety system, but to make it misbehave. And obviously this is something uh, that the nuclear industry is doing, but it is not easy. If it were e if easy or if it were a no-brainer, we wouldn't need regulation in that space. But guess what? I mean, a couple of years ago, the NRC has figured out, oh, uh, you know, the industry is, is really not up to the task, so we have to threaten them a little bit by taking away their operating license. 
so this is happening. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, uh, just think in, in, into the future. At, at this time, uh, the majority of the U.S. nuclear power plant fleet um, is, is operating analog in, in this respect. However, this is going to change because guess what? You can no longer buy these analog components. All of the vendors are going to digital. Um, it would be no surprise for you to hear uh, the vendors, they uh, didn't consider security that much. So, so that certainly does extend uh, to these more sensitive products and uh, this is what keeps companies like mine busy. Well, let me ask you one last question then, since uh, we don't have any others. And I was very curious, as you were going through the uh, slides, you were showing lists. You had a couple different lists of things there. And, and they were actually quite good, because I was thinking about oh, thanks. systems I know. And I was like, OK, yeah, that would fit in this case. This yeah. would fit in this case. Were those more examples, or do you think that's the beginning of a uh, taxonomy or, or some sort of you know, structure where every attack could be put in one of those categories? Well, I, I see it more like the beginning of a taxonomy. So I'm, I'm uh, pretty confident that uh, so certainly we, we cannot do this all on our own. We cannot do that alone. But, but if you think about research organizations, um, that uh, we can really arrive at, at a very solid taxonomy and a, at a methodology. And this is actually uh, some area w that I had always assumed this would be something that DHS would actually do. As it turns out, they don't, but uh, maybe they should. Um, anyhow, certainly uh, a, a micro operation like mine cannot do that, the full thing. So uh, I invite everybody to, to take part in this effort uh, because I think it's substantial, yeah. especially uh, just uh, for, 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 for one other good reason. Uh, how many times, I mean, the, the consultants or government people in this room, how many times have you been in the situation where you present um, uh, the asset owner um, uh, your risk assessment and uh, you tell them, ah, oh, that's pretty bad and this is what you should need to do in respect to mitigation and they just discount the risk. Uh, well, I've been there many, many times. And uh, I believe things will change and uh, I did experience that for my business. Uh, when you really can break it down to process control and to the process itself and, and really make the point now, look, if I do this to this one engineering system or whatever, then this is what's going to happen. So uh, I think uh, we, we will achieve much more credibility, especially when pointing to the critical risk. So uh, like, uh, well, this will just ruin the company. And, and if you make that credible, well, then you got the board's attention. So please join me in that effort. Thank you very much, Ralph.